But today we're going to Pergamos. Pergam, Pergamon. The church in Pergamos. Pergamon, Pergus, Pergamos. Named after the skins and the techniques that they would use to make paper. It is said that the papyrus was named after Pergamos. If you have it, Revelations 2 and 12. If you have it, say, I have it. To the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. I know your works, check this out, and I know where you live. I know, I know your city. I know your address. And then he says this. Even where Satan's seat is in your city. Satan's seat wasn't in the church at Pergamos. But it was in that city. Re referencing the city there. Not the local congregation. Although the devil did infiltrate. He says, And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even those days wherein Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against you. Because thou hast there them that holdest the doctrine of of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols. And to commit fornication. To be immoral. I'm going to tell you something. God has not changed his mind on morality. What God said is, was a sin. Or what God said is, is sin. It's still sin. Fornication, sex outside of marriage is sin. Adultery, sex with someone other than whom you are married to, is sin. Homosexuality, sex with persons of the same sex, and lesbianism, is sin. Bestiality, sex with an animal, is still sin. Incest. Sex with your near kin. Mama, daddy, sister, brother. Child. Is sin. Pornography. Is sin. 
ordering dolls, sex, to sex dolls to come in the mail. You got a paper dolly that you can call your own. Now you know you messed up. It's sin. Don't want to gloss over these things. Don't want to run past them too fast. Because I tell you what happens. People then see it as uh, permission. Some things you have to revisit. Well, Pastor, everybody knows. Speak for yourself. You're not the pastor. God tells us. Homes have been destroyed. Hearts have been broken. Children's lives shattered. All kinds of things because we refuse to get a grip on this. Ministries crumble. All kinds of things happen. People are bitter. People are hurt. People are jaded. People are diseased. Blood supplies threatened. Conditions that you can't get rid of because of fornication. Marriages don't last. Because you got married, because the sex was good. You didn't even know the person. All you knew is that they could. They knew how to. They could all night long. Then got married and found out that there's more to life than somebody still got to cook the bacon. Somebody got to raise the children. Somebody got to help pay the bills. Somebody got to, you got to have conversation. Whole lot of things. Whole lot of things. And then there's integrity. I, I wonder what kind of comments they're going to post online when they hear this. There he goes again. You are right. And that's all I got to say to that. To commit fornication. Uh, so thou... So hast thou also them that hold fast the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name <laughs> written, which no man knoweth. Saving he that hath received it. I got a new name over in Zion. Isn't that something? That's not what I'm going to preach about, but that sounds good. Verse 13 says, Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Holding on to the name of Jesus. Hold on to the name of Jesus. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm holding on to the name of Jesus. Tell that same person, hold on to the name of Jesus. Bless us, Father, as we preach today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thou holdest fast 
my name and hast not denied my faith, my name, my faith. You have not denied it. John MacArthur said this about the saints in Pergamum. John said, despite the difficult circumstances in which they found themselves, the believers at Pergamum courageously maintained their faith in Christ Jesus. Despite the difficulties which they found themselves, in which they found themselves, the believers at Pergamum courageously maintained their faith in Jesus Christ. End of quote. Before I comment further on this statement, let's take a look at the city of Pergamum and its contextual settings before we move on. Pergamon, as you know, is in Asia Minor, one of the seven churches, was 100 miles north of Ephesus with uh, Smyrna located about halfway between Pergamon and Ephesus. Unlike Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamon was not a port city, but was located some 15 miles inland from the Aegean Sea. So north of Ephesus, about 100 miles, 15 miles away from the coast of the Aegean, with Smyrna, uh, about halfway, half the distance between Ephesus and Pergamum. Are you with me? Yes. Not only was um, Pergamum not a port city, it was also not on any of the major trade routes. So you had to be on your way to Pergamum to go to Pergamum. The major trade routes bypassed that city. Yet it was the ancient capital of Asia. And as Asia's ancient capital, Pergamon was considered Asia's greatest city. The Roman writer Pliny called it, quote, by far the most distinguished city in Asia. Wasn't a port city, wasn't on the trade routes, but it was the capital. Hence, where Satan's seat is. Some things, some places are significant. Capital of any state is a significant place. The White House is significant because it speaks for the nation. Jerusalem is significant. Are you with me? It was the capital. Much of Pergamon's Pergamum was built on a large canical hill towering some 1,000 feet above the plain. The, the hill was shaped like a cone. And 1,000 feet up above the plain, there was the majority of this city. So impress, impressive is the sight, even in modern times, that the famed 19th century Archaeologist Sir William Ramsey, he commented, he said this, quote, beyond all the 
all other sites in Asia, in Asia Minor, it, Pergamon, gives the traveler the most impressive of a royal city. The home of authority being the capital. The rocky hill on which it stands so huge and dominates the broad plain of the Caicos River Valley so proudly and boldly. The city was something. Truly, a city sat on a hill. The capital city, the city that had power to control Asia Minor. Are you with me? Now, concerning MacArthur's comments on its safety, MacArthur writes, Pergamon was an impressive or an important center of worship for four of the main deities of the Greco-Roman world. The temples dedicated, there's four of them dedicated to Athena, Ascalipus, Dionysus, and Zeus were located there. Four major temples erected to four false gods. But overshadowing the worship of those deities was Pergamon's devotion to the cult of emperor worship. Hear me. Pergamon built the first temple devoted to emperor worship in, in Asia in the year 29 B.C., in honor of Emperor Augustus. They built Augustus a temple, and the citizens of Pergamus worshipped the emperor as God. Later, the city built two more such temples, honoring Emperor's Trajan, and Septimus Severus. So now we have three temples that are erected to men. But these were Caesars. These were men of unlimited power. They weren't men who could be blocked by presidents. You you weren't going to hardly veto Augustus, a Trajan, or Septimus. They had power. And we got three temples in Pergamum dedicated to them, and four temples dedicated to the Roman Greco gods, Athenia, Escalipos. Uh, Dionysus and Zeus. The city thus became the center of emperor worship in the province. And there, more than in any other city in Asia, Christians were in danger of home from the emperor worship cult. Elsewhere, Christians were primarily in danger on the one day per year they were required to offer sacrifices to the emperor. In the other cities, it was just one day. Maybe if they could hide that one day, they could avoid being put to death if they decided not to offer sacrifices to the emperor. Perhaps they could avoid uh, suffering a lesser fate if they could hide on that day. But in Pergamon, they were in danger every day. Every day of being killed 
because someone would call upon them to worship the emperor. And the true Christian, even if it cost his life, knew that he couldn't worship anybody but Christ. The thing that dominates my thoughts as I study Christians of other eras is that they were certainly much more Christian than we are today. I just showed you where bishops and preachers got together with Muslims and Hindus and blessed a Planned Parenthood center uh, in D.C. Now you know who they're targeting. And the overwhelming majority of the preachers were all of color. If you are able on the broadcast, let them see the faces on the screens. And they smiled. And they prayed without shame that God would bless a woman and give her the right to do what she wants with her own body when no one can do what they want with their own body. You can do some things you want with your own body, but I can tell you a whole lot of things you can't do with your own body. Go rob a bank with your own body. See what happens. Yeah. With your own body, walk up to a police officer with a gun and aim it at him with your own body. Go up to a perfect stranger and just slap him with your own body. Let the right people see you with cocaine marijuana, or any illegal substance, putting it in your own body, or even possessing it, holding it in your hand, which is a part of your own body. Let the authorities catch you trying to take your life. Isn't that your own body? Let them catch you. They'll put you in a straitjacket so you can't with your own hands in your own life which lives in your own body. There are multitudes of laws that governs what we do with our own body. Let the man catch you with your own foot which is part of your body going 80 miles an hour in a 55 mile zone. See what happens to you. Uh, you were doing it with your own body. They were much more Christian than we are. In Pergamon, they lived in danger every day. It is likely that the martyr Antipas, we'll talk about him in days to come, was executed, at least in part because he refused to worship the emperor. I don't think that they would respect most of us, the Christians back then. I don't think that they would. I'm, I'm certain that uh, I'd make my argument that they would not. They would probably call us a bunch of spoiled brats whining people who basically suffer no persecution. Think about it. What have you suffered from anybody because you love Jesus? Now, there's a lot of things we blame on the devil. The devil then divided my house. Was it the devil or was it your behavior? 
Now, it might have been the devil in you to mess things up. See, that to me, the devil won't let me get ahead. You sh What'd you do when you were in school? In America today, now this won't go over well, but I tell you these things because I love you. In America today, most poverty is tied to bad choices, bad behavior. See, this is my challenge with the social justice crowd. I am a believer that we can work on things and make uh, America more fair and more just. And, and I approach that quest with acknowledging that we're the most just country in all the world. People here have more freedoms than anywhere else in this world. I'm African American. African Americans do better in America by far than anywhere else in the world. You don't see us trying to leave, do you? After they finish all their complaining, they go home. Marcus Garvey started that movement back to Africa. The, the black folk couldn't vote anything else. They said to him, bye. So, oh, no. No, we're here and we're going to stay. Say amen. I saw, I saw something on the uh, bumper sticker of a redneck's truck one day. He said, had we known it would end up like this, we never would have had slavery. I said, praise God. <laughs> yeah, we can make the nation more fair. But one of the things that I would say to my social justice warriors is that there is a caveat that is often left out. I agree with the argument that all men are created equal. And that fairness should extend to all. Having said this, all actions and all behaviors, however, are not equal. How, to what degree have your actions and behavior, your behavior, handicapped your life? To what degree do you factor in your choices, choices that you've made? Somebody get that phone. <laughs> Your choices that determine where you are in life. See, you can't take that off the table. Did you take advantage of the opportunities when they came or did you squander them? That, that's got to be in the discussion for equality. You can't, you can't have an equality discussion Amen. without including decisions, right. actions, right. work ethic. Yes. Yes. See, it's too simple to go to uh, the equation. It's too simple to go to skin cut. And, and not saying that doesn't play a part but long before we get there, there are some other things that need to be factored in in our quest for fairness and social justice. That's good preaching. Uh, I think I've been up too long because you all... 
Well, maybe I haven't. I told you if you say amen, I'll preach fast. So maybe, maybe, you, maybe you get something out of this. Is, is it? You know, I told someone the other day this, and, and it didn't go over well. The, the, uh, the premise, uh, and the news won't talk about it, because I found out the media is just, you know, if you don't fit their premise, their narrative, they won't interview you. Someone asked me the other day, they said, you know, I don't see you in the news anymore as much. What happened? I said, I started to film them when they filmed me. <laughs> and would put the whole interview online, and they, they, they stopped there because they couldn't splice my words up anymore. <laughs> so I got rid of them, just began to, isn't it amazing? They resisted showing the whole interview. So they said, okay, we ain't calling him no more. He got wise. But I, uh, the, the narrative is that if you're white and you're stopped by the police, you don't have to worry about anything because, because you're white, they're going to treat you differently. But the white people I talk to, all of them tell me that when they were children that their fathers told them, when the police stop you, do this, this, and this. Don't do that. Do this, this, and this. Now, what's my point? My point is, the narrative that is out there is you get different treatment for no other reason than that you're black. And whites haven't had to say anything to their kids because they're going to get preferential treatment. But the white people I talk to tell me that their dad or their mom told them, when you get stopped, do this, this, this. Don't do this. Don't do that. So the, the question is, could it be that part of the problem, and statistically, you could argue to, statistically, that that may not be one from if you look at the arrest records. But could it be that part of the problem is at least for 73% of our families, the black dad is not in the home to tell the child how to act when he stopped by the police. Does, does that factor in at all? Could that contribute to us not knowing? Should there not be a clarion call to our men and tell our brothers, go home. Go home. Raise your children. Talk to your sons. Talk to your daughters. Talk to your families. Talk to them. I'm going to move away from this. When I read these things, I wonder, uh, how Christian are we? Because of the prevalence of idolatry and emperor worship, Pergamum was hostile, was a hostile and difficult place for the saints to live. Another reason why Pergamum was such a dangerous place for the Christian was that Rome had made the rare move of giving Pergamum the power to practice capital punishment. So Pergamum could put the Christians to death. And they exercised that rare power. That power uh, to kill the Christian was symbolized by the sword. <coughs> that, excuse me, that power was symbolized by the sword. That power to kill the Christians 
and to practice capital punishment was symbolized by the sword. The sword was the symbol of terror for the saints at Pergamum like the swastika is to us. Like the stars and bars is to us. Praise the Lord. These things are ugly symbols. On 95, someone has erected a huge flag on their private property. A flag that represents white supremacy. When you see it, it makes you want to speed up. Already going down the road driving 100. <laughs> speed up to 105. So let me get out of here. Lord, don't let my car break down. Down there near Dunn, somewhere like that. Help, Lord. It's designed to intimidate. It's designed to send a message. It's designed to say that there are wicked folk in this society and in this world. And when we see it, we get, we get the message now. You have to wonder, what does that, what does that mean? That means keep going. <laughs> Whatever you do. <laughs> Amen. It's designed to intimidate. Well, the sword was designed to intimidate the believers. Ah, this is why you ought to, ought to attend church, though. Uh, that Sunday, however, when the angel of the church at Pergamos stood up to preach the message that was delivered unto him by the angel, who got it from Jesus Christ. Who got it from God the Father. That's why you ought to attend church. Had he missed church. They didn't have any streaming. They would have missed the message that day. Because I had our text say. In verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos right? These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So I know they're trying to use the symbol of the sword to scare you and to intimidate you. But I want to tell you that there is a sword that is stronger than their sword. See, saints, don't you ever forget, there is a God. At the end of the day, there is a God and he's the God of the Bible and he has the power. I wish I had a praying church. He has the power to make things right. He said, yes, I am the God who has the sword of two edges, the Ramphaya. The Ramphaya is that large sword. Y'all go get my sword. It's hanging up in my... The huge sword, sword with two edges. As a matter of fact, Jesus identified himself in Revelation 1 and 16. He said, and he had in his right hand, John is saying this, seven stars. And then out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Good God Almighty. The word of God is more powerful than the devil. Jesus says, I have the sharp two-edged sword. The ramphire, it represents the word of God. The Hebrew writer said in the Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick, living, and powerful, and sharper, than any two-edged ramphire, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The word of God goes down on the inside of you. Here comes the ramphire. Look at that thing. Good God Almighty. 
Uh, anything, ain't that something? That's that two-edge, uh, sharper than any two-edge. So God will get you going and cut. Miss you one way, catch it here. Isn't that something? This is what he's. This is what he's symbolizing. Uh, amen. Take this back uh, to where it was. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. See, he's saying something to them, and the recipients of the letter they saw it. And the, God's word is it, it deals with our innermost being. That's why people don't like. In, in many cases, good, hard preaching. Preaching goes down to the bone. Preaching goes down to the bone. And preaching separates the joints from the marrow. Preaching, the word of God, is not just superficial. God's word won't just affect you on the surface. God's word goes down in your soul. This is why the, the gospel preacher is such a controversial divisive person in society because when the word is preached the word affects you the word finds you if you are a liar the word will find your lying self if you are a fornicator the word will find your fornicating self if the homosexual the word finds you sissy and if you're living holy the word finds you there the word of god goes through all of the veneers. It convicts the drug dealer. Yeah, it does. And it encourages that struggling person to keep on keeping on. The word of God gives you power in the face of death. And then when you're sick and you've been going through a long-term sickness and the enemy trying to work on your mind, the word will come right at the right time. And you'll find yourself, even though you've been going through, being revived again by the word of God. And, and don't mess around and grab your Bible and start reading the thing. Don't you grab your Bible and start reading it and letting God the Holy Ghost speak to you. And then the word begins to reveal itself to you. That word will heal you. It will heal you from being raped as a child. The word of God will heal you from all manners of abuse. The word of God will drive demons out of your house. The word of God will make them wayward, wicked children straighten up. The, the word of God will convict that, that husband and that wife. The word of God takes the racist and make them love you. The word of God, hallelujah, takes the rebellious and make them get in line. The word of God is sharper. Sharper. Somebody shout sharper than any two-edged sword. Lift your hands and tell God thank you. I heard the apostle Paul when he began to deal with the word of God. In Ephesians 6 and 17, I heard him say, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now here, uh, Paul wasn't dealing with the, uh, the big sword, but he was dealing with what is called the Micaiah, a little short sword. Uh, between 6 and 18 inches long carried by the Roman soldier and the principal weapon for hand to hand combat and ready for use at all times isn't it wonderful that God's word gives you power to fight at a distance and power to fight up close and sometimes after the devil that got in close you still need something to thwart him and get him off of you. He then got all in your house and he then, then, then invaded your body space and, and then got in your mind. Isn't it good to know that the word of God will cut all that out? Somebody today, you've been fighting up close with the enemy. 
the devil done invaded your home. I hear the Lord speaking. And he's walked into your bedroom. And the devil has tried to crowd your mind. But I'm here to tell you today that God's word will deliver you. It'll give you strength to live another day. Somebody's been under the weight of some heavy trial. But you ought to throw your hands up and say, I'm going to live and not die. I'm going to let God's word cut the devil away. Because the word of God is able. Lift your hands and say, yeah. And I've got news for you. It's ready for use. It's ready right now. Matter of fact, there's never a time when the word of God is not ready. There's never a time when the word of God is not ready to deliver and ready to set free. We have to get ready. We have to grow our faith. And when we get ready, God says, I've been, I've been here all the time waiting on you to believe me. Somebody today is going to believe God. And when you believe him, he's going to set you free. And when the preacher at Pergamos began to preach and hold up the sword, I'm, I, I'm sure he reminded them that the Bible said, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In Matthew 24 and 35, everything's going down. But the word of God, but except God's rim fire, everything is falling. But the word of God, we used to sing, get in the word and stay there. Stay there till he comes. Get in the word and stay there. Stay there till he comes. Jesus said to the saints, who were living in those wicked and dangerous times. He said, I want you to know that I know what you're up against. And I even know where Satan's seat is. Now let me, let me unpack this and then we're going home here. No service tonight. Shiloh was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Some say that when he's talked about Satan's seat, he was talking about the, the altar of Zeus that was a part of the Acropolis of Pergamon. And then others said that he was talking about the god Escalipos. Escalipos was the god of healing, symbolized by a snake. People would come from miles around from all over the ancient world and go to the temple of Escalipos. And in that temple, there was non-poisonous non snakes crawling around all in the temple. People would go in that temple who were sick in their bodies and they would lay on the floor in that temple or some would go to sleep hoping that a snake would contact them believing that they would be healed isn't it amazing what people are willing to believe when they doubt God and yet still others believe that the reference to Satan's seed was a reference to emperor worship that was throughout the region and then some believe that Satan's seed was a reference to Rome itself I kind of believe that all of it went in hallelujah Jesus it was a wicked city and it was a wicked place and it was not an environment that was conducive for the saints but I thank God that despite this wickedness Rocky are you with me despite all the trouble that was going on in Pergamum the Bible said this about the Christians with all this going on you hold fast my name I wonder today is there anybody here living holy in difficult circumstances living holy in a wicked neighborhood living holy in a wicked home living holy on a wicked job they're trying to tempt you you're living holy in 
Mount Wicked High School. Is there anybody here living holy on a wicked college campus? I want to know today, are you still holding on to God's unchanging hand? If you're holding on, I want you to thank the Lord for giving you power to hold on. Yeah! My friends are trying to get me to fornicate. My friends are trying to get me to leave my church. My friends, my family, they're telling me that I'm wasting time serving the Lord. But pastor, I'm not listening to them. I'm holding on to God's unchanging hand. I'm not hanging on. I'm not barely hanging on, but I got a firm grip on my Savior. And I'm here today to say that I won't let go. Come what may, I'm gonna hold on to the Lord. Yes, yeah, yes. Everybody who's holding on, praise God for power to hold on. Praise God for a man to hold on. Oh, oh, Jesus, thank you for power to hold on. Somebody just grab hold to him. somebody and tell him I'm holding on to God's unchanging hand. It may not be popular. I may be in the minority. My friends may have left, but I'm not going anywhere. I remember at the temple, Church of God in Christ, oh Lord, when I was a young man, when somebody would backslide, we'd always talk about it. I said, Lord, that part of you that they gave up, give it to me. Cause if they don't want you, I want you. I mean heaven all the way. How many today can stand up and be glad to shout that even though Satan's seat is sometimes in my city, sometimes in my home, sometimes you can find it in the church, somebody trying to resist you, you didn't let them get to you, you're going to serve God anyhow, even when you stumbled, did you get back up and say, God, I'm going on anyhow, even when you got weak, did you pray and ask God, Jesus, to revive you and give you strength to live this life in your modern day Pergamum? I wonder today, do I have anybody here who can testify and say, he is, he is a keeper. He will keep you through the storm and rain. Oh, I know that he's a keeper because he's kept me so many times he kept me when i couldn't keep myself he kept me when i felt like throwing in the towel he kept me when i felt like giving up oh lord oh lord he kept me yeah yeah Somebody praise him right now. Woo! Hallelujah. You held fast to my name. You didn't deviate from my name. Jesus. 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 I'm closing.
talking about somebody ought to say, Jesus. Mm, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Do you love his name? Call his name. Jesus. Uh, there's no other name under heaven uh, given among men that we might be saved. Jesus said, you have not denied my name. That means everything that has anything to do with me. You didn't deny it. Lift your hands and call him Jesus. When I was studying this, seemed to me I could hear Kurt Franklin and uh, uh, Ranch Island uh, as they said that something about the name of Jesus. It's the sweetest name I know. I could hear, hallelujah, First Lady and Pastor Wright saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Saints, let's call that name for there's still healing in that name. There's still joy in that name. There's power in that name. Won't it keep you? Won't it deliver you? Won't it give you joy? It's in that name. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Mothers praise him. Men praise him. Women praise him. Everybody praise the name of Jesus. Everybody praise the name of Jesus. It's that same name. Heal my body. Told me to run on that name. Pick me up and turn me around. I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to take it back. But I'm going to worship that name. I'm going to glorify that name. I want the world to know that I love the name of Jesus. I praise the name of Jesus. I celebrate the name of Jesus. You can have the athletes. You can have the movie stars. You can have the politicians. But I'll take Jesus for mine. Yeah. Oh, yes, I will. I don't need but a few of you to just begin to leap up and down and call that name. I get a few folk to shout on this one. And you haven't denied my faith. Everybody who's a born again Christian, praise God for being saved. Yeah. Yeah. Go on and praise Him. Give Him glory. Thank you.